most of the time. You can just go borrow what you need. Maybe you only are going to use it once, but then it's not sitting in your garage. It's somewhere you can return it so someone else can use it. I know my husband likes buying tools, but... She's talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I was writing this book, I kept thinking, what the private sector can do so much, but what do we need government to do? What will only government do to make these green jobs happen? And it seemed to me there were really three vital roles. One is setting goals. And I'm so proud to be in California where we have set ambitious greenhouse gas reduction goals through AB 32 and subsequent legislation. So setting goals, developing ordinances like the city of Portland did for the deconstruction ordinance. But most importantly, where's the funding going to come from to create some of these green jobs? And that's where government can step in and say, you know, private business, it's great that you're internalizing profits and externalizing costs, but you know what? Externalizing those costs in society is hurting the environment or it's hurting people. So we want to discourage that behavior and we're going to levy an externality fee on the thing you're doing, like burning 10,000 tons a year of fossil fuels that <coughs> are causing climate change. So. We created cap and trade in California. Uh, we have an externality fee on plastic bags. Uh, we created bottle deposits years ago that has increased the recycling rates in, in states with bottle deposits. So I'd like to see more of this to help fund some of these, particularly government sector jobs um, that are doing the work that so desperately needs to happen. I want to leave you with one final thought. So this trip we took to Europe two years ago, we, um, we went to northern Spain to visit a friend of mine who I met my semester in Madrid in college. And Esther lives in this, in País Vasco region in the north, in this town called Vitoria Gasteiz. And it's everything you hope a small city will be. It's got these cobblestone pedestrian-only streets with shops and restaurants where every night everybody comes out onto the street and sees their friends, oh, how are you doing? How are the grandkids? And it's just such a lovely place. We had so much fun there with, with Esther and her husband and her daughters, the daughters. And at one point Esther said, Justine, we want to take you on a tour of the Gothic Cathedral in our town. It's really the pride and joy of Vittorio Gasteis. It's called Santa Maria Cathedral. And so as we're walking through and admiring the Gothic arches and the stained glass windows, we learned that construction started in the year 1296, and construction finished for the first section of the cathedral in 1437. So think about it. It started in 1296, finished in 1437. The architects, the workers, and the patrons who started working on this cathedral knew they wouldn't be alive when it was finished, and yet they endeavored to work on it. They wanted to leave this legacy for future generations, this gift to future generations. And so I'm walking around looking at this beautiful cathedral, and I'm thinking, people 600 years ago were thinking about our well-being and this gift they were leaving for us. What legacy are we leaving for generations six centuries from now? Is it really going to be climate change and mass species extinction? Is that the best we can do? But then the more I thought about it, walking around looking at the beautiful paintings and, and everything, I thought, well, you know, we, we are trying. We are putting in solar panels and we're putting in increasingly large windmills. We're trying to recycle. We're trying to sequester carbon. It's just not at the level that it needs to be. And so when the Green New Deal was announced, I thought, ah, oh, maybe we're finally going to have enough resources thrown at the problem to address it at the level that the challenges we face require. And so my book, The Great Pivot, is my attempt to try to give, share ideas with people who, who everybody has different interests. Pick your issue, where you want to plug in, how you want to help. I think there's something for everybody. And I thank you for the opportunity to come share highlights of my book, and I'll open it up for questions. While you were talking, I, I, I'm personally, my life is dedicated to these issues. 
And uh, but there's there's a number of things that didn't get talked about, and it's not getting talked about. Um, hemp building materials need to be developed because they don't burn. All of the all of these rural interface areas need to have the hemp building materials, and we need that industry. Um, can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear. Oh, sorry. Hemp building materials. I wasn't. Don't hurt. Um, uh, we need uh, new rules for these interface areas. It's not just PG E. It's the way we're taking care of the land and the way we're building the things. Agreed. Uh, so, uh, water harvesting to. To, and, and, and soil biologists to, to make sure that that biology in the soil is healthy. Um, uh, and we need them in every city, every government, and, and all developers all. Um, the um, urban wildlife the habitats, we need, we need to have those. And we need garden cities. And we need like Singapore. So these are these are the kinds of things that I work on, and I just wanted to share them with all of you. Thank you so much for helping me make the point that this list is by no means exhaustive. Yes. <laughs> Not even close. I'm just trying to get people to start thinking. Well, what else is missing? What else do we want to find? funding for. So thank you for bringing that up. The wildfires, I think, are top of mind for everyone, and there are 650,000 homes in California at the wildland urban interface that maybe shouldn't even be there, and if they're going to be there, they need to be fireproof. So yeah, I, and the media is, so it's one whole area. The media is just not getting it. I mean, all they do is blame PG, and it's just, it's our fault. It's too facile, definitely, definitely. So there's a lot of the transition needs to include those. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. I was curious about the word in the uh, de deconstruction of the houses. Why would they have stopped at you know, 20, 1916 or whatever? Why not just say that all homes need to be deconstructed? Was there something about newer homes that did you, I mean, I don't know if you. Really good question. Why 1916? Why not all homes? Um, they just moved it up to the 1940s. It's either 1940 or 1945. They moved the data. I talked to a contract, deconstruction contractor, who said, starting in the 1970s, construction included a lot more glue. Like, they, construction firms started gluing a lot of pieces together. So trying to deconstruct and get pieces back apart so that you can recycle them is a lot harder starting in the 70s. So. Portland did move it to 1940s, and why not all? I guess it was just somewhere to start because almost everything is wood back then or valuable metals. So, yeah, you can talk to Sean Wood, who heads the program in Portland. So, that's kind of one of my biggest things is the whole like end of life looking at things. So, it's like for everything. You know, you mentioned the, the, the cycle. Of, uh, for manufacturing and that China doesn't want any of our, our plastic anymore, but like when you look at how much plastic is actually produced in China, if we could just send them back all of the plastic, <laughs> then, then we'd probably be like pretty darn good on plastic, because like right. when you see how much stuff comes from China. First stop buying more oh, stuff. Well, but, but if we, I don't know, I'm all about like upfront like cost, like you should be paying for the cost to the end of life of the product. So that way you can make a decision as a consumer. Do I want to buy this product? It's really poorly manufactured. The end of life cost is very high. Therefore, you know, I'd spend more money for it up front. But, so yeah, I, I enjoyed all of it. I just hope that people will get on board with the end of life cost. So. That's, that's a good point. Because like, if you go to Costco, there are all the produce is in those plastic wrapped. You know, everybody wants perfect apples, so they want them all individual and not touch each other so they don't get bruised. Maybe there should be a fee to make it more expensive to buy those so you'd be less incentivized to buy, even though it's mass, you get 20 apples for a lot cheaper than if you go to their produce place. You're paying for all that plastic, but then ends up, you can't reuse those things. So, right? so Cal ETA is doing a lot with that, like bed the mattresses, for instance. Like they're rolling in, there's a fee in front when you buy your mattress that's used for recycling the mattresses, paints. 
the EPA, Cal EPA has gotten on board with that. And so pretty much like all products <coughs> have that sort of design approach in the price. Because mm -hmm. you know we have a system where it's a capitalistic system. So it's like we have our money and that's the, if we were actually paying for the true cost of the right, product. The true cost. The true cost. Yeah. And then people would make more educated decisions. Then maybe the apples in bulk would be cheaper Correct. than these apples in this plastic. Exactly. That's you know, right. Then maybe the straw wouldn't be relatively exactly. free. People would be like, oh, I want the straw. It's 85 cents for yeah. that thing because it's going to cost that much to recycle. Just, just and it, it makes a big difference to shop at farmer's markets. I mean, just so no. the money goes directly to the farmers as opposed to through Costco. Costco is a great company, but um, farmers don't get paid as much. Justine, doesn't um, Germany have a, a program where every manufacturer has to take back their product when it's life cycle over? They do, the, the Green Dot program, and they hire a third, third party to, to take the materials. But waste prevention would be, uh, so you had a common question and then... Oh, just wondering, what is reverse catering? Reverse catering, thank yeah, you. Sure. There's so many stories I wanted to tell you all, but I don't know. Um, the book, right? So reverse catering, there's a nonprofit in San Francisco called Replate, and they charge $40 a pickup if Salesforce has a big conference um, with a catered lunch and they have 300 pounds of couscous salad left over, they'll go on their app for Replate and say, we have 10 trays of food, please come pick it up, here's $40. And then Matt Stepanovich will drive over in his car and pick it up and drive it to the homeless shelter in Emory Mill. So oftentimes uh, companies expect free pickup. They think, I've got free food, somebody should come pick it up within the hour and take it off my hands for free. But by paying for it, just $40, you're creating a job for someone. And so there are a, a lot of um, reverse catering Nonprofits that, that will do it for free and rely on philanthropy, but a more direct way to do it to create jobs. Well, I'm so sure that it might help them plan better the next time they do it to not have the waste. Exactly. That's, that's the next part of the evolution. So once you end up, oh, we've got 20 extra trays of food, maybe we should plan better next time. Really good point. Yes, I'm wondering um, when you look at Europe compared to the United States and the list of things in the Green New Deal. Do you see that there's more progress in some areas of the world than the United States? And if so, why do you think that is? Maybe it's, maybe it's, uh, you can't really, well, maybe Northern Europe, for instance, Scandinavia. They seem to probably be more advanced in many of these areas than the United States. And what is the reason for that, do you think? Um, I, I get a lot of questions. Does this, does this framework apply to other countries? And I say, I really wrote it about the United States because I feel like we're so wasteful in so many areas that just just reducing the waste is going to save us a lot of money. So it's a different model than Europe or or other countries. I feel like Europe has a lot more a stronger regulatory framework, and we've been we've been dismantling our regulatory framework over the last three years as quickly as we can. Um, so we have a stronger goals and ordinances than we do and I think it may be time to take another look at it to to see what, what our societal goals are and if government can help us move in that direction. Do you think money in politics in the United States is a big reason for that? Um, yes. I don't know that it's productive to talk about that right now. <laughs> I, I, was, I, I was telling someone that I was talking to before that I had a whole chapter in my book, my draft book about follow the money. And it was so bitter and angry about the way money flows through our economy and is hidden overseas in tax shelters and people aren't paying taxes. And I was just getting so mad. And I was trying to be optimistic and light and show solutions in the book, but I just took it out and set it aside. Yeah. I agree with what you're saying. <laughs> You mentioned that unemployment was an all-time low. What percentage of jobs are minimum wage? Um, that's a good question. Too many. And, yeah, and some of them pay the federal minimum wage, which is $7.25, and some cities have raised them to 15 It's certainly not enough to live on here in this area. Not many of these are jobs you aspire to, probably. I, yeah, I, th I think a key part of the Green New Deal that's being discussed is a family supporting wage. 
I mean, there, there are a lot of um, social issues being rolled into the Green New Deal discussion. And what I thought was really interesting is the pushback um, on universal health care that some people are pushing back on. Well, why are you including health care in the Green New Deal if you're trying to increase the number of green jobs? And one of the projects I'm currently working on with a, with a nearby college is creating a green entrepreneur accelerator to support people who want to start their own business doing building deconstruction or zero net energy retrofits of commercial buildings. And it's hard, lonely work starting a business if, any, if anybody's done it. And the thought of leaving a job where you have health care and you lose your health care when you leave that job is pretty scary. So if we want to encourage more people to go out and start businesses, if we have that safety net for them of universal health care, they'll be more likely to grab the trapeze and swing over to the other platform. So. That's, that's very true. I've canvassed for Medicare for All, and when I talk to the young people, I've been up all the time. And it's something they haven't thought of. The freedom. Um, maybe, well, uh, we have a visitor. Jackson Chu, who's currently uh, an assemblyman, I guess is where we are now, or 